Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to speak on a subject matter that I think is of increasing importance to all of us as providers of pediatric health. Um, I have no financial relationships or conflicts of interest to disclose. However, I will be showing on a monitor some names of health plans, um, direct consumer telehealth corporations, and uh, retail pharmacies, but that's for illustrative purposes only. <clears throat> The use of telemedicine or telehealth is on the rise on a national level. There's increasing clinical applications. What started out 15 to 20 years ago as a means or technology to reach out to children living in rural and underserved areas for outpatient medicine is now increasingly being used in inpatient settings, emergency departments, in the home with chronic disease management, schools, daycares, and it's also being increasingly used by providers that are non-physician, as it should be, including dentists, nurse practitioners, uh, the many therapists that we have to help um, provide health care to children, audiologists, etc. It's estimated that last year in 2014, there were 20 million telehealth consultations, and that number is expected to re um, increase to 150 million consultations by the year 2020. And I know that sounds like a Star Trek year, but it's only four years away. <clears throat> Not only has a, a clinical, the clinicians noticed the increased utility of telehealth and telemedicine technologies, but so have investors. Um, this is a graph created by IHS Technologies, which is a Wall Street firm involved with global um, health finance forecasting. And again, they predict an exponential rise in both the number of patients as well as potential revenue generated using this technology. I'd like to say that there are many, many great things about telehealth. Again, for those of us that have been working with it for many years, we see uh, an opportunity. These are the six domains of the Institute of Medicine and Healthcare Quality. And in particular, particular when you're talking about patient-centeredness, when they don't have to travel long distances to be able to see a subspecialist or equitable, where we're able to more reliably reach out to those living in rural and underserved communities, that the potential for telehealth is very, very good. This has also been noticed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and this was published in July of this year, coming from the section on telehealth care with lead author Dr. Brian Burke and Whit Hall, under the leadership of Peter Denal and Josh Alexander. I mean, this is a great review for those of you who haven't reviewed it about the history of telemedicine, clinical applications, and other considerations such as legal credentialing and the finances of it. As well, the Committee on Pediatric Workforce under the leadership of Mary Rimza um, published this, the use of telemedicine to address access and physician workforce shortages. Again, seeing this as a potential tool um, to, to address disparities in pediatric health care. So what I'm going to focus on in the remaining 14 minutes here is on direct-to-consumer care. And I want to explain what that is. That is where a family member, a patient, is able to use a computer at home, a laptop, mobile technology like tablets and iPads, um, and even mobile devices like their mobile phone to access a clinician for immediate health care. Um, and why use it? The big reason is for convenience on the patient side. They don't have to go to the clinic. They don't have to go to the emergency department. It's easy to use, um, and consumers are demanding it, frankly. I have here a short video um, produced. It's in the public domain on YouTube um, by one of the direct-to-consumer telehealth provider companies, and I just want to play that to get for illustrative purposes here. I've kind of blacked out the, the name of the company um, and eliminated some of the audio. Nights like these are far less stressful than they used to be. It was so easy. I was able to connect to a doctor without leaving the house. I logged into my son's account and followed the simple point and click instructions to schedule an appointment. From the list of pediatricians, I selected one that had the option to visit now and available by video. On the next screen, I entered earache as the reason for the appointment. Shortly after the appointment was placed, I got a text and an email notification that the pediatrician was ready to see Jason and me. We connected to him through a video for consultation, where he asked detailed questions about his symptoms. Jennifer, from the good history you've given me and the reaction I see by Jason when you tugged on his earlobe, it's most likely that Jason has what's commonly known as swimmer's ear. I'm going to prescribe antibiotic ear drops, which you can pick up at your local pharmacy. If his condition worsens or he does not improve, please consult with your child's pediatrician. Have I answered all your questions? 
Well, some of you are probably thinking, wow, that's really cool, uh, like my wife was, until I tried to remind her that I was a pediatrician. Um, and then some of you are probably thinking that, wow, this is really terrible. And I'd like to say that you're both right on this, and that's OK. Um, I think that the increased interest, the second reason, in addition to uh, convenience for patients, is about cost savings. If you're able to do this, and avoid a visit to the emergency department, urgent care clinic, or primary care provider's office, the payers of health care are going to save money. And I think that th this can be a good thing if done in the right way. Um, this is an estimate, again, by proponents of this. And they estimated that if all health care that didn't need in-person visits given the previous example, we're done using this technology, $6 billion a year could be saved. Again, but the methods of that uh, are fair enough to come into question. Now, here's where I throw up uh, some corporation names and things like that. And the point is, again, is that everybody's in the game. They're the five largest health plans in the United States are all in this. All of them have web access for lives that they're covering to be able to access a physician this way. And then the next five largest uh, telehealth, direct-to-consumer telehealth providers are working with the health plans to be able to provide the physicians. And they, on the side, have their own web access so that anybody can go online and talk to a doctor this way. Um, and then the next are the next four largest retail pharmacies in the United States. And again, they are all involved in the game. When I first came up with this slide, I tried to do a connection with the lines because sometimes the health plans are working with different direct-to-consumer telehealth providers who are working with different pharmacies, and it just became literally like a spider web here, so as, as this is becoming rolled out in different uh, markets throughout the United States. And so um, why not? I'm not sure if you get these emails, but I get them not infrequently as a provider to join one of these networks. I can earn up to $100,000 a year in just two hours a day. So sounds pretty good. Um, and if you look at a lot of their websites and the health plan websites, what do they treat? Well, they all list cold and flu, which you might think may or may not be amenable to this modality, but they also live, list ear infection which would be difficult to treat without an otoscope, I would think. Um, sore throat, whether you do some diagnostic testing there. Asthma, maybe you can uh, use them, look at the patient. But even as an intensivist, I occasionally use my stethoscope. Um, <laughs> UTIs, again, there's no access to the urinalysis here. And um, yeast infections, I'm not going to go there. Um, and then, is this good health care? I think that most of the, the folks that were thinking, wow, this, is, this has some problems, are concerned about the medical home, as we should be. The physician-patient relationship. For the most part, when you log on, there are some health plans that will use providers in the network. And there's even applications where you're able to, to connect with your own pediatrician or physician this way. But that's a minority of the cases. For the most part, you might get somebody in different states that has gotten multiple state licensure this way. But of course, it calls into things that we consider in the medical home, including patient, uh, physician-patient relationship, access to the medical record. Again, sometimes they have access to that, but mostly they rely on families to input allergies and medications and things like that. Uh, limited physical exam, as we've noted. Um, no ability to do any diagnostic testing. Um, and all of these come out, along with the medical home, with issues on quality and safety. A lot of these um, online providers, including the ones that come from the health plans and pharmacies, will provide via email a summary of the visit to the, to the consumer, which they and then are supposed to share with their primary care um, physician with this. And there's not good data on this, but there is good data to suggest that a majority of times this doesn't happen. It's like cheating on your mechanic or going, you know, going out to dinner with you know, a different boy or a different girl. It's like cheating on your provider. So most of the families don't share this with their PCP. Is this fair care? This is another big issue for us. For those of us that have been using or been working in telemedicine for many years, we've seen this as a great opportunity to address disparities, right? This is a technology that was used by our neonatologists to save the life of a baby that presented to an outside emergency department while their, their duct was closing and helped the ER doctors uh, start um, prostaglandin. 
This is a technology that our nurse practitioner and lactation consultant used to help a mother breastfeed uh, for the first time with a baby that had a cleft lip and cleft palate that was born in a Snowden hospital in the Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> and the mother had tears streaming down her face. This is a technology that our PM&R specialists and um, hospice care providers or palliative care providers help see children that are mostly bedridden at home that are technology dependent. Um, so there's lots of great opportunities, and this is what we've been thinking about this. But in this application, um, it's available for privately insured, a lot of employer-based um, health plans, and it comes with a significant copay, anywhere usually, typically from um, $50 to $100. And so not every family can afford that. So it's a little bit disheartening for those of us that have been working in this, trying to use it to address disparities when actually it can create disparities. The other thing is that you hear this a lot from primary care providers, which I am not there. We do this already, and we don't get paid for our services. And I actually put this to test one time when a mother of a child that has cyanotic congenital heart disease called to the ICU. I was able to hook up with her and her baby uh, securely using video conferencing, saw the baby, reassured the mother, everything was good, did phone call up, the baby was doing well with a slight cold. Um, and I ended up writing a note and uh, submitting it for payment, which it was very quickly rejected. But this mother with the same health plan had the ability to go online through her health plan and access a doctor from, I don't, from wherever um, that clearly would know this child's history and that physician would receive payment that way. So there's things that we have to fix here. <clears throat> and then there's also the question about increased utilization. While many of these patients um, that use this technology end up then not needing to go to an urgent care center, the, the physician's office or emergency department, about between 10 and 20 percent of them when they surveyed after using it, what would you have done otherwise? They said, nothing. I would have just dealt with my cold, I guess, but this allowed me to do that. So, I mean, that's probably a minor concern here. The data, the research here, the importance of research we've been talking about is very, very limited. This is one study that was done at the University of Pittsburgh Health System where they compared adult females that went in with UTI symptoms and they compare 99E health visits versus 2800 where they visited primary care and it's from the same uh, cohort of the, um, the insured population. The use of urinalysis was under 10% in the E visit. They would have to refer the patient for that. And all but one of them were prescribed antibiotics versus in the clinic visit where the use of the, or obtaining urinalysis was about 50%. And similarly, antibiotics were around 50% here. So clearly you see, you see the problem of um, underdiagnostic testing and overprescription of antibiotics. Um, but even with the cost of antibiotics, they estimated the e-visit cost to be cheaper than the in-person cost, which um, is a priority for some. Another study that just came out, it's not yet to come out um, in press until April of 2016, but the, it was a pre-release of the data here, where they studied about 400,000 potential users of an online health system where they can go use it online or in person in the state of California. CalPERS is the largest state health employee um, plan. And they looked at three HEDIS measures here. Avoiding antibiotics for acute bronchitis. Again, this is among the adult population. And what they found that 28% of the times antibiotics were avoided in person versus 17% of the time in e-visits. Again, over um, more use of antibiotics. Um, another one that the authors thought, hypothesized that the e-visit would do better, which is avoiding imaging for acute low back pain. They found no statistical difference between the, the, the re referring for um, radiographic images. And then the third thing they looked at was testing for uncomplicated acute pharyngitis. So the idea is that if you're going to um, prescribe antibiotics, presumably for a strep throat, was there a test done? And again, that was done 50% of the in-person visits and only 3% of the e-visits. 
So again, raising a lot of concerns here in a growing industry and what we need to do here at the AAP, I think that a good reference point is what the, um, the Committee on Practice and Ambulatory Medicine published in 2006 and again in 2014 when it talks about uh, retail-based clinics because I think a lot of what they're talking about, the threats to the medical home are similarly applicable to this direct-to-consumer model where children are being treated at home that way. And in this year at the um, annual leadership forum at the American Academy of Pediatrics, District 3 submitted a um, a proposal here that was in the top 10 that called the use of telehealth to extend the pediatric medical home. I do think that while there are threats to, the, to this technology and how it's being used, there are also opportunities and it's incumbent upon us and we have the opportunity to do the right thing, to both be able to use this technology to give it within the medical home as opposed to outside of the medical home. So I didn't come up with the, uh, the title of this talk. That's from my colleague, uh, Dr. Brian Burke, who's a big Trekkie fan. And so I went to um, some of the Trekkie websites. And oh my gosh, so I, that was a discovery in and of itself. It's like, it's more thorough than PubMed uh, when I was doing a quote search. Um, but I did find one that was relevant. And again, this is for Brian. Jim, there is a historic opportunity here. And again, I do believe that. I think that as pediatricians, we are the ones that the parents want to connect to from at home. And we can kind of, in a way, get rid of the middle person here, the middle management here. Because the healthcare, the health plans as well, they want the pediatricians. They don't necessarily want this third party uh, provider who doesn't know anything about the patient. But it's, we have to organize ourselves to be able to do this in an effective manner. And so there's lots of steps to that. I think there's lots of people, uh, Josh Alexander, um, Chelsea Bodner, that's been working a lot on this and a lot of thought. And I think that, um, again, keeping this on our radar is going to be very, very important for the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. That's good.